shit. It was the only word that I could muster out upon encountering the incomprehensible pressure that had just filled the space around me. The kid wasn't himself anymore. I was starting to understand. I... It wasn't his own power that he had a hard time trying to control. It was something residing inside of him. As his metamorphosis continued, he'd become only about a head shorter than Kente. His form was so fluid while remained solid at the same time, like a floating, gaseous form that vaguely resembled a human. Afterwards, his original dark gray color quickly began morphing into a blinding, golden light. After about five seconds, his dynamic body finally settled on a concrete form. There was only one word I could really use to describe it. A warrior. Tall and lean, with thick, flowing hair that extended down to his shoulders, he held a lance seemingly composed of sheer light, along with a complementary shield. He had armor on, albeit minimally, just chest shoulder plating along with a pair of knee-length shorts. The potential origin of such an entity was lost on me. The mere presence of it evoked a sense of awe, danger, and beauty all at once. Surprisingly, Kente began smiling at the sight of AJ's transformed state. A bloody ear-to-ear -ear grin devoid of any humanity at all. Looks like the evil's finally come out, he bellowed, before bolting at him. AJ's warrior form managed to counter all of Kente's initial attacks before delivering a brutal sequence of his own. He slashed Kente across the stomach, creating a deep gash, before impaling him through the torso and smashing him through a metal side beam. Still, I couldn't get too excited. The whole situation seemed oddly familiar. Kente encountering an enemy initially more formidable than himself, getting beat down at first only to end up massacring them in the end. Regenerating nearly instantly while also getting bigger and stronger in the process, we were going up against a rapid evolution, which was one of the worst powers you could possibly hope for an opponent. In any case, it seemed as if AJ was intent on finishing the job early, which was really the only option here. He took his lance and swung it with inhuman speed, slashing Kente more times than I could possibly count. It was a gruesome sight as blood gushed out of every inch of his body, staining the metal beneath him red. AJ went for another stab, but this time Kente managed to deflect the blow and close the distance between them. Got you! He screamed. He was wrong. AJ took his palm and rammed it into Kente's neck, causing him to spit out what looked like a gallon of more blood. AJ then took out the butt end of his lance and drilled it into the other side of Kente's cheek, puncturing it all the way through. Fuck, I muttered. That gruesome sight. Of course, Sandu didn't seem too surprised. He'd seen this before. But at the end of the day, the only thing that mattered was getting rid of Kente right then and there. AJ grabbed his lance and pulled it down, creating a massive gash down Kente's cheek, down to his jaw, ripping through his gums and breaking teeth in the process. But even that wasn't enough. Kente howled like a maniac and managed to grab AJ's neck, ripping a good chunk of his flesh out. AJ reeled, but was still able to thrust the lance straight through Kente's torso once again. Still not enough. Kente swiped at AJ's head, twisting it around completely. At that moment, I was sure that he was dead, but Sandu didn't seem all too worried yet. Another blinding flash of light burst through AJ's body, before he seemingly morphed again, taking on a new form entirely. This time, he resembled an archer atop an armored horse still with the golden aura surrounding him. I remembered something. Each void had an official description assigned to it for database purposes. Most of them were a few paragraphs long, save for AJ's. His was short and vague, containing only one short phrase. The warrior's spirit. I never knew what to make of it before, but I was starting to understand now. AJ directed a flurry of arrows at Kente, sticking him with about six of them. However, that form was also quickly obliterated as Kente dragged him down from the horse and stomped his head like a watermelon. After a flash of light, this time I closed my eyes. Upon the death of one form, he began cycling through others, manifesting into various warriors throughout history. A hulking, powerful Viking, a skilled, relentless Zulu soldier, a fast, unyielding samurai. With each transformation, he dealt Kente more and more damage. But that was the problem. Kente just kept getting stronger as a result. And AJ couldn't seem to finish the job. After five cycles, Kente was bordering on the size of a house, with his veins resembling steel pipes. He picked up another of AJ's warrior forms by the neck and began taunting him. I know evil. I've seen it. And I'll never lose to it. Using a single arm, he lifted him up and slammed him into the ground. 
Years of destruction and rebirth, forced evolution, surviving the abyss that lies before death over and over again until enlightenment is forced onto you. To the uninitiated ear, that might have sounded like the ramblings of a madman, but to me, it yielded a daunting realization. Sandu recognized it as well. I could feel the horror in his eyes. Throughout history, humans have done too many cruel things to each other to possibly count. Yet for what reason? Well, that list is unending. But even amongst the dark sea of bloodshed, war, and torture, there's one brutal practice that stands out among the rest. The true origins of it are a mystery, both in date and location. Some believe it was developed by the Aztecs, some by the Spartans, Mongols, Ming Dynasty, Roman legionaries, Nazi Germany. Some even claimed that some modern militaries still made use of the practice. The only thing that we knew for sure was that it existed. And it sounded horrific. I'm sure it goes by a lot of names, but the one given to it by the government is the evolution ritual. In my opinion, that name doesn't do its sheer brutality justice. I'll try to paint a picture. Imagine an empty, medium-sized concrete room devoid of any windows, illuminated only by a few dim light bulbs above. Fill that room with about 25 to 50 men specifically selected due to their exponential combat prowess, as in fighters, soldiers, mercenaries, etc. Now seal off all the exits and inform the subjects that only the last man standing will be afforded the right to leave. Leave them to fight to the death. Conduct hundreds, or however many of these, death matches at once. Next, divide the winners into smaller groups and repeat the process until only the last men amongst hundreds, possibly thousands, are left. Next, seal those men off into a dark, confined space for 50 days. No food, no water, or any kind of stimulants. That one that manages to survive all of this are the successes. The conjecture went as follows. If any individual's mind and body managed to endure such a torturous gauntlet, they would have eclipsed some kind of threshold, undergone some type of rapid evolution. These were the men with exceptional latent potential, the ones who possessed something more than conventional strength and willpower. Under such drastic circumstances, their minds will have tapped into a reserve of power beyond human physical and mental limitations. I'm gleaming over some details, of course, but that's the gist of it. Sounds like bullshit science to me, but hey, what the fuck do I really know at this point? Sandu and I learned about the existence of this ritual following an internal branch of information that was even classified for us. We also learned that sometime after World War II, a unit of soldiers and intelligence officers came across the aftermath of one of those rituals in a large, remote, and decrepit building somewhere in the desert after the White House received some kind of obscure message containing a pair of coordinates. Inside, there were upwards of 1,100 human skeletons, all scattered throughout various rooms in the structure. The strangest part? There was a set of small chambers at the center of the building, where six emaciated, horribly scarred men were shackled to the walls. However, while certainly dead, they hadn't even begun decomposing yet. Except for one one man was still alive. The mysterious figure was dubbed the Unkillable Man. To this day, we have no idea what kind of organization conducted the ritual, or who sent the coordinates. And the biggest question? Why? I'm getting off topic here, though. We also couldn't figure out who this mysterious Unkillable Man might be. And although this was by no means definitive, we now had a clue. Before AJ could get another word out, Kente killed him again. By this point, I'd regained some movement in my limbs, which allowed me to crawl over to Ken and Sandu, who were now certainly looking worried. Sandu, I said, how many transformations can the kid go through? He just shook his head, as if he knew the answer, but didn't want to say it. I looked over, watching as the kid, who'd now become some kind of centurion, tried desperately to put Kente down. Now, I'm not sure if the kid was getting weaker, 
or if it was Kente who was getting way too strong. But the problem was obvious here. At that point, the kid was only delaying the inevitable. Something else needed to happen, and soon, but we were done for. I know what happens when he gets pushed to the limit, Sandu spoke up, but he's really scared of. If that happens, then... He trailed off for a moment. I didn't want it to happen. I thought this was going to be enough. Don't like the sound of that, Ken muttered. Kente killed the centurion by strangling it. This time the kid transformed into a hulking Templar knight. I could see Sandu visibly gulp. That's it, he said. That's the form he takes before everything goes to shit. If Kente kills this one, then... God, I fucked up. At that point, Kente had become so durable that the kid's attacks hardly phased him, yet he didn't even attempt to stay down. I suppose that was the so-called warrior spirit, fighting even in the face of impossible odds. At the same time, all we could really do was watch. But before the two could engage in their penultimate clash, we could hear a whistling from just behind them. Everybody turned around at once to see Nassar, casually strolling towards us. Wow, when do you get so big? He said, his eyes wide and awe. Have you become evil as well? Kente growled. Nassar put his hands up in a defensive gesture. I'm just here to have fun, big guy. What does that mean? Almost like an answer to his question, we could hear a set of booming footsteps approach from behind Kente. A colossal figure was barreling towards us. The Titan had arrived, and from the way that Nassar was grinning, I can only assume that he was the one that released it. As primal logic would dictate, the Titan went for the biggest guy in the area. Kente, who was now around the same size as the Titan, crouched in a defensive position. I won't let Eva- He was cut short by an abrupt headbutt. For such a big thing, the Titan was disturbingly fast. Their exchange was short, but utterly brutal. The Titan slashed at Kente's chest, tearing a large gash through it. Kente strikes the Titan's jaw, dislocating it. The Titan rips off Kente's left trapezius muscle. Kente gouges all of Titan's eyes out. The Titan crushes Kente's right hand while swinging blindly. Kente drills his fist into the Titan's crotch area, demolishing its goods. In the fit of blind rage, the Titan grabs Kente's head and slams it into the wall, planting it deep before dragging it along, tearing through the metal like butter. Kente grabs the Titan's head from behind and drags it down hard, causing the bones from its necks to snap, piercing through its flesh. I could have sworn Kente had grown three feet from that exchange alone. As he tossed the Titan aside, he looked back at us, half of his face now torn to the skull. Nassar looked like he was about to pass out from excitement. Fuck yeah, he shouted, jumping up and down. That was fucking awesome. Kente silenced him with one punch, easily vaporizing him. There wasn't much hope before, but there was even less now. Sandu's warning had been vague, but I doubted that it was any kind of exaggeration. The kid readied his sword, a vain effort considering the fact that he was about to go down. And then, we were all screwed. Or so I thought. The time that the Titan had bought us was about to prove more than valuable. As Kente prepared a blow that likely would have finished the kid off on the spot, a stream of projectiles hit his face, causing him to flinch just slightly. I turned to face whoever had done that. To my surprise, it was Bella. For one reason or another, the bloody painter was back. You! Kente roared. Ken was happy to see her, of course. You came back, he said before his face dropped. But now you're gonna die. Have some faith in me, won't you? She said. I wouldn't be here if I didn't have a plan. Plan? Kale suddenly appeared behind her. Well, I guess you can call it a plan. I didn't have much time to put it together, though. In any case, we were hardly in a position to protest. Kente barreled past the kid, nearly foaming at the mouth, as he rushed Bella with overwhelming killing intent on his face. I'd like to say that Bella looked unfazed herself, but that was far from the truth. She narrowly dodged his tackle, hardly looking calm and collected at this point. Kale attacked Kente from behind, attempting to sink his teeth into his skin. His fangs broke immediately upon contact. Oh, fuck this, he said, before being tossed into a wall. However, he managed to distract Kente long enough for Bella to make a move, running to an adjacent intersecting wall and looking down. Shit, she said before looking back at us. Distract him, 30 seconds, that's all I need. 30 seconds might as well have been an hour. 
before Kente could rush back towards Bella, Ken snapped forward, forming a couple of portals on the ground in which two crocodile-like creatures emerged. They were destroyed in four seconds. The kid went after Kente next, which posed another problem. No, Sandu shouted. Don't let AJ get near him. Kale groaned, pulling himself back. Oh, all right. He jumped in between Kente and the kid, pushing the latter backwards before blocking a punch from the former with his arm. The arm was obliterated as he was launched backward once again, but he managed to buy about three more seconds while doing so. Ken opened up three more portals, blood now pouring like a fountain from his eyes, nose, and temple. God fucking damn it, he mumbled, shaking as he forced his ability to the limit. But then he smiled. Guess I trust you, though. Two of his creatures attacked Kente, while the other one kept the kid occupied. That move managed to waste another seven seconds. I looked back over at Bella. She was holding up ten fingers. Nine. Eight. But Kente was already on the move. He reached her in about three. To tell you the truth, I can't say that I've done a lot of heroic things in my life. I mean, sure, I stood up for a kid that was bullied back in the eighth grade. Intimidated a guy out of breaking into a parked car once. Broke up two bar fights before. But nothing that had actually put my life on the line. Truth be told... I was never really willing to do so. I'm sure it's a sentiment shared by most. And it begs the question, if you knew that your inactivity would lead to death regardless, would it really count as a heroic act in the end? But knowing that I didn't have much time to think, these thoughts were racing through my head as my feet were already moving. Hey, asshole! I screamed. As I got within about a meter of him, Kente turned to face me. I nearly shit my pants on the spot. I had no plan, no set strategy. I wasn't even planning on throwing a strike. That would have been pointless anyway. There was also no way that I was going to block or dodge any of his attacks. I suppose that right there and then, I was fully prepared to die. Maybe I hadn't even realized it myself. But then, the luckiest thing that had ever happened to me happened right there and then. I always prided myself on having good balance. Rarely skidding on ice, never swaying on boats or trains. Always pretty good at sports. However, in that moment, I slipped on a patch of blood. And by some miracle, it came at the exact moment Kente's fist was about to contact with my face. Instead of my skull being pulverized, his knuckles only grazed the side of my cheek, ripping a large gash through it as he did so. I mean, sure, it hurt like hell, and I wasn't going to be taking any girls for a while. But I managed to buy enough time. Bella shot another stream of blades at the back of Kente's head, turning his attention away from me. The next few moments went by rather slowly in my mind. I watched as Kente darted forward in a flash while Bella scrambled like hell out of the way. As she was doing so, a figure had stepped out of the adjacent hall behind her. I didn't need to know who it was. His moves spoke for themselves. It was... the dancing guy. Shuffling cheerfully along, Kente himself even hesitated for a moment, but it was too late for him. As they collided, the dancing guy's MP3 flew out of his hand. For a moment, time seemed to stop. The dancer froze in place for what must have been ten seconds. During that time, even Kente couldn't seem to bring himself to move. It was the calm before the storm. For a split second, the dancer's expression contorted into something that I'd likely never be able to get out of my head. It was an indescribable look of sheer, otherworldly rage. I blinked once, and when my eyes opened back up, I was met with a wall of red mist and flying limbs. One of Kente's oversized arms even flew at me, nearly dislocating my shoulder as it did so. The man that we'd previously deemed as immovable, insurmountable, a wall, had been demolished in less than a second. Now dripping in blood, the dancer strolled over to his fallen music player and plugged it back in. All of us watched in stunned silence as he shuffled off and out of sight towards the opposite hall. Kale was the first one to speak up afterwards. Now be honest, I was 99% sure that wasn't going to work. Bella let out a laugh of half relief, half disbelief. I looked over at the kid who was still in his night form. However, he looked confused almost as if his reason for existing had suddenly vanished. Soon enough, he was reverted back to his original human state. AJ fell to his knees, coughing up blood in between sobs. 
Sandu quickly rushed over in order to tend to him. Is everything done? I thought to myself. Save for Clint. TFVNH was dead. So were all the voids, except for the dancer. And the still contained calamity. Guess it's over then. That was ballsy, man. I looked over to see Kale grinning at me. Grinning at Kente like that? Fucking hell. <laughs> I let out a slight chuckle. Hardly able to believe it myself. Yeah. I guess. How's Hugo? Kale shrugged. Guess some things can't be helped. Think I gave him a good send-off, though. In the meantime, Bella was talking to Ken. I'd help you out, but... She said, wiping some of the blood off of his face, which was entirely covered with it. I don't... I don't know what to do here. Yeah, it's more of an internal pain. <laughs> it's got a badass, though, do not it? Looks kind of gross, actually. They both laughed. That was great. How, what did you do there? He said. Let's call it lucky. Thanks for trusting me there, though. Thanks for coming back. I really appreciate- Oh, shut up! You guilt-tripped me into it, you asshole! Before he could speak again, she pulled him in for a kiss. Not wanting to make things awkward, I directed my attention back to AJ, who was beginning to settle down. You alright? I asked Sandu as I walked over. In a place of response, he simply got up and hugged me. I owe you. A bit longer and we'd all be... His voice began to tremble. Hey, it's alright, buddy, I said. Don't worry about it. At least it's over now. He let go of me and looked at everybody else. I... Oh, all of you. About time I did something good for once. Ken responded. Bella sighed before smiling. Yeah, same. That dickhead killed the first friend I made in a long time, Gail added. He had it coming. A period of silence followed. As we all began coming to terms with the events that had transpired, not the easiest task. Aww, how touching. A familiar but completely annoying voice reverberated from behind me. I knew I'd forgotten about something. I turned around, seeing Adrian standing right there, wearing his signature stupid smug smirk. Who the fuck is this? Kale blurted out. Adrian ignored the question, looking over at the kid instead. That's a cool little ability you got there, he said. You know where it'd come in real handy? Oh no, I said. Please don't say it. His grin grew wider. The evisceration matches. Hey guys, I just want to make sure that all of you take a look in the description down below for multiple different reasons. The main reason I'm talking about right now, though, is to look at the author's links. Every time that I do a story on one of these platforms, I post links from the authors. Some of them are books that the authors put out. If you like the stories that you hear, then I highly, highly encourage you to go scroll down, take a look in the description, click one of those links. If you like that author, I guarantee you they have something else that you're going to like. And if they have a book out there, you're going to love that book. I mean, hell, that's how Tales from the Gas Station became what it is, okay? If you guys heard it on YouTube, then hey, there are more, bigger, better versions of it out there that you can get on Amazon or Audible or No Sleep or what have you. So for reals, uh, the, scroll down, check out the links. And that's not like an advertisement thing. I'm just like, look, you're, this is for your benefit. Check it out. And as always, I want to give a very big thank you to everybody who supports me on Patreon. Thank you so much. A very big thank you to Jordan Alexander Sanchez, Stephanie Butler, Reaper61167, Bobby Carmen, Tristan Pelton, Chance Burnett, Diana Krause, Vicky McQuicky, Santa High, Crusader Chocobo, Spooky Shell, Adam Morris, Grand Moth the Milky, Big Smoke 369, Captain Scurvy, Salty Irish Poet, Esteban, Raiden Morris, Nate Cull, Horror Fan 1212, Hour Minute Second Time, Kyle Resnack, David Martin, Scarrington the Unkempt, Robert Malcolm, Angela, Spanky, Snoochy Boochie, Seclude, Lupita Galvin, That Creepy Chick, Tyler Fletcher, Merxidum, Red Shadow Cat, Xavier the Cheyenne, Demix, Sean Catabaker, Six Gay Rats in a Trench Coat, Turtle Man, Rob Like Sharp Things, Violinian, Xavier Graphius, Lord Life's Best, Goring Tramagasy, Maria Walker, Emily Mitchell, Crazy Kid, Mr. Marcus Blitz, Aka Limcha, Dirt Diver o Matt Bach, Voice of Sand, Coffee Zombie, Hidden Tiger, Shelly J, Jeremy H, Psychomel, Nana, Deleted Account, Melted Lake, Tali Sue, William King, Darth Miver, Michael Ortiz, Satanic Aries, Bardo Hawk 764, Lambda M98, Harley, Sashi Sazaku, Cronut 509, Kaylee Ambrose, Suji Campbell, Stricken, Freddy Krueger, Happy Birthday Jason Wilson, Lisa Cottrell, Caspian, Hades Nephew, Tater Chip, Acid System, Prozac and Pancake Appreciation Society, Benjamin Welverett, Cryptic Nightmares, Kiri the Sloth, Fester's Lampshade, Sky Harbor, Nico Kyle, Raphael Rodriguez, The Ginger Bros, Aaron Stormcrow, Daniel Polson, and Corey Kenshin. As always, thank you guys so, so much. 
because you guys help me do everything that I do here. You guys help pay authors for stories and commission stories and do everything that I can do to make this channel and make this podcast a- a- the best it could possibly be. So thank you all for supporting me here. And as always, everyone, sweet dreams.